As I was preparing for this homily, I am being reminded, of course, of what has went on the last four Sundays previous. We've been talking about the idea of being in relationship with Jesus Christ. The I Thou, we spoke about that about four weeks ago, I think you might have remembered me saying it. And then we spoke about the I Man, of course, which means God and man. And then we spoke about the two becoming one flesh, which is just a couple of weeks ago. There is a theme going on in these particular Gospels that we are reading at this moment. And of course the theme is that relationship, that spiritual life that we take into ourselves to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. As I read a couple of different commentaries on this particular chapter, I found it very reassuring, I suppose, that what I've been saying up to now has been a kind of coming together in today's one. In today's gospel, we see that we are always on the desire to be with God. Our inner beings, in who we are, in what we do, and how we do it, is always pointed towards. Jesus Christ. There's a great saying in the Catechism, I suppose, when it says the beatific vision. I don't know if ever you remember the Penny Catechism mentioning that. The beatific vision. That's what this is all about. That's the end game, in a sense, is the beatific vision. And we are on that quest, we're on that journey from the moment that we are conceived to the moment when we die. That's the, the kernel, I suppose, of the whole thing. But in between those particular times, there's a lot we have to try and do. And as I was reading the commentaries, one of the, one of my uh, go-to guys, I suppose, that I actually go to is a fellow by the name of John Shea. I think I've spoken about him before. He's a theologian, also a, spirit, a spiritualist, and he's also a Catholic priest. And John Shea writes on this particular passage, and I'll just read it to you. In spiritual tradition, blindness is the inability to notice. Understand and integrate the spiritual dimension of life. Without this ability, we have no true wealth. In the Gospel of Thomas, in Book 3, it states, When you know yourself, you will be known. You will understand that you are a child of the Living Father. But if you do not know yourself, you will live in poverty. And you are poverty. In this condition of not knowing, you become the sons of the living one and become beggars. But it is not surrounding yourself with money or status that will give you the desire. You find yourself beseeching others who have the ability to see in a spiritual life, to share it with us. When I read that, and when I tried to pray with it, and listened to it, and tried to see what John Shea was saying, I understood something. We all are trying to be spiritual. Some of us more than others, that's true. But those of us who, I suppose, think to ourselves that we can't be, we impress on others to be and to share their spirituality with us. Some would say, if you're listening to the likes of Thomas Merton, he would say that's a bit of a cop out. <laughs> he would say that's a kind of a imposing one's idea on someone else 
so that you don't have to do it. That's the way Thomas Merton would see it. It means it, you won't actually get out and try to live a spiritual life. You would say, well, you do it for me, and you pray for me, and that will be fine. I do what I do, and you do what you do, and everything will be, will be happy. Funky dog. But that's not what this gospel is talking about. Even the society which we live in also looks at that particular idea that, yeah, there is people who are spiritual, who are the ones who leads and guides and tries to, to help others. But there's also ones who are trying to suppress the other. And that goes on all the time. Oh, be quiet. I want to hear what Father says. Or be quiet. Don't be asking Father all those things. Or don't be asking me. It's not that they're asking, they're saying that don't upset Father. Really what they're saying is, don't ask me to listen to God's Father. Which is true. Someone who is very spiritual, sometimes we look at those people and we will say, oh, that's a charismatic person. You know, he's fine, leave him alone. <laughs> Just let him... Let them do what they have to do, it's fine. Let him do all the prayers, you do the work, let him do the prayers. Instead of turning around and joining him in prayer. Our part is prayer. And it's kind of like that that we find ourselves most of the time. We kind of impose our ideas on others. So that we won't have to do that particular one. And when someone does try to come out of the, the woodwork in a sense, like this blind man who calls out to Jesus, Son of David, have pity on me, we say, Shh, be quiet. You know, Jesus is coming. I want to hear what he says. I don't want you shouting out me. And what does Jesus do with us? Jesus is on a journey. He's on a journey from Jericho to Jerusalem. And he is going over to the new city, the new Jerusalem, where the covenant of God is going to be revealed in an uncomplimentary way. But unconditional love is going to be carried out in that place. So Jesus is going towards this particular journey. And this blind man who sits on the road represents us in a way. As we call out Jesus, son of David. He uses the word son of David. Why? Because he's going to David's city. He is going to the new city, the new Jerusalem. And he is going to give of himself to us in that city. So we're calling out Jesus, son of David. Have pity on me. Allow me, Lord, to go with you into that journey. That's what happens in this particular piece of work, in this particular gospel. This man who is blind calls out, and then Jesus stops along the road and says, What can I do for you? I wonder how many of us have actually tried to listen to God asking us that same question. What can I do for you today? What do you want me to do for you? If Jesus stops along his journey, this very important journey, he actually takes time to wait and to look to see what this man asks. This man walks up, he's blind. Now mind you, they use lovely language here. If you're reading the Jerusalem uh, Bible that I sometimes read, they would use that he actually flung. Now he don't, he, in this one it says it throws off the cloak. In the, in the Jerusalem one he uses, he flung it away. It's kind of like catches it and throws it away. Completely. He makes it, it it's a more dramatic, um, I suppose, way of looking at it. And then he sprang to his he sprang to his feet, they would use. 
But here he just said he's frank. But he's frank of two deep feet. <laughs> That's a really nice way of putting it. You ever see anyone getting up really quickly? That's what that is. They spring up. They have a spring in their step. In other words, he was ready to go to Christ. And when he gets to him, Jesus turns and says, What do you want me to do for you? He says, I want to see. I want to see. What is it that he wants to see? What is it that you want to see? Because that's the question that he's asking us. What can I do for you? And your answer is, I want to see. What do you want to see? I want to see all the miracles that you do, and I want to see everything that goes on around you, or I just want to be able to see the daylight in front of me. Or is there more involved? There is more involved. This beggar is not looking for sight, as in i.e. to see my hand and clothing in front of me, but to see the inner being of God. That beatific vision which I started out talking about. He wants to be in that relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he wants to see. And Jesus tells him, your faith is saved you. He didn't say, I'm going to cure you of your blindness. No. He tells him his faith has saved him. Why? Because you have come to see, and you have seen. The light of Christ opens him up to the understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is not the fairy godmother. We're going to grant you every tiny wish that you want. But he is the concerned individual who wants to see you in paradise which he promises. And sometimes it's a little harder to get it. Jesus causes no attention to himself, but he asks us to be attentive to him. There's a slight difference in that. When you take that idea, you then look at what society is doing and what you are doing, and you try to muddle your way through society to follow Christ. All the money in the world that you have, the fine houses, the big cars, everything that you have, if you were to take it all and sell it, you would never be able to buy that desire. That's what he means in Thomas's gospel there. You will be always in poverty. You are poverty. Because no matter what you have in this world, it is not going to be able to give you that desire of being with Jesus Christ. Thomas Merton, Thomas Keating, John Shea, John Paul II, Pope Francis even now, Mother Teresa, all of these people understand that desire. That desire to be with Jesus Christ. The I, thou idea. The I, man. The two becoming one in relationship with Jesus Christ. And it allows us then to stand on the side of the road and to call out to Christ. Jesus, Son of David, take pity on me. Let us pray that we may be able to do that. And that Jesus will stop for us along the way and call us to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.